Hello, and welcome to The Writing Coach. I'm your host, Kevin Johns. On this podcast, I speak with the instructors, editors, coaches, and mentors that help writers and authors create their art, build their audience, and sell their work. In this episode, I speak with copywriting expert, Joanna Weeb. writer in its natural habitat, you know? I finally got it. I don't believe in drills. As a former teacher, I believe in authentic writing and, and really getting into your story. I think it's each one of our responsibilities that when we learn a particular craft, I think it's kind of your responsibility to share it so that we can take storytelling to a new level. My mom doesn't understand. My dog just doesn't seem to get it when I talk to him. But when I go to my mastermind group, they get it. They understand we speak the common language. Keep writing. Keep creating. Never, ever stop. Life doesn't stop. So we got to keep on creating to continue creating the life that we want to create. You're listening to You're listening to the right coach. 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 Beloved listeners, and welcome back to The Writing Coach. It's your host, author, writing coach, and ghostwriter Kevin Johns here. So let me take you back several years ago to when I first published my very first novel. I put my book out into the world, and I realized I knew everything absolutely nothing about business. I also realized that if I was going to build a career as an author and sell this book of mine, I was going to have to learn about business. And a key part of business is copywriting. So when I started searching out resources online to learn about modern copywriting, I discovered the blog Copy Hackers. I bought all of the books that the mind behind the website, Joanna Weeb, had written about copywriting. I took some of her courses, and I learned all about the business of modern online sales advertising copy. You know, I know a lot of indie authors listen to this show, and if you are going to make a career as an author, at some point along the way... You're going to be writing some sales copy, and Joanna is a wonderful person to learn it from. As I said, Joanna is one of the minds behind Copy Hackers, a brilliant website and business that promises to help you write more persuasive, believable, and usable copy. Sands the pixie dust so that you can boost your website and email conversion rates. Joanne is also a speaker, a fiction author, a copywriting instructor, as I said, offering a number of instructional books and resources, many of which I've used and read and consumed myself as part of my own business and copywriting education. So I was really honored and thrilled to get the opportunity to talk to Joanna. During the interview, Joanna discusses how a movie she saw as a child ultimately shaped her career trajectory as a writer. She discusses why she thinks an undergraduate degree in English literature is a great idea, something I happen to uh, agree with. (laughs) She also discusses the difference between direct response copywriting and conversion copywriting. She touches on why she decided to not write the final book in her young adult trilogy, the reason templates fail to work in both copywriting and fiction writing, what she took away from a week focusing on Facebook advertising. She shares her tips on how fiction authors can write better blurbs, right? Address the dreaded blurb. And she discusses how she's working to help authors conquer that blank page via software that she's developing called Air Story and much, much more. It's a great interview. So let's cut to that interview now. 
currently a well-known copywriter. You're also a speaker. You're an instructor, a copywriting instructor, as well as an author. Uh, but if, if folks haven't touched base with you yet on, on one of those various things that you do, can you kind of bring them up to speed on who you are and, and what you do? Yeah, sure. I am, I am a writer. I am a copywriter and a novelist. Um, I make my living, though, as a copywriter, hands down, and the novelist stuff is just for fun. But yeah, so I'm the founder of Copy Hackers, which is a space where businesses go to learn how to write copy that converts. Um, so writing better websites and emails and ads and things like that. Um, so that's what I do in the day and into the evening. And then late at <laughs> night and early in the morning, I, I write for fun. Maybe this is just a misunderstanding, but I think generally when people think of copywriters, I think they still kind of have that idea of, you know, the stodgy, slightly sleazy old man. <laughs> wow. Whereas, you know, you're obviously a young, hip woman. Oh, geez. So I was wondering, do you represent a new generation of copywriters or do you see yourself as an anomaly in, in a field that is still kind of this kind of macho old man field? Well, it's, it's, I, I would, I mean, I've never met a copywriter that I've thought was like you described. So I, okay. I don't know if those people exist or if they're just, you know, made up by the media because it's far more interesting than, than seeing, you know, a writer sitting and thinking, right? <laughs> so like, just like, you know, novelists aren't also sitting around drinking all day and then going F. Scott Fitzgerald on the world. They're just like, writing they have coffee and tea and they write um that's kind of the thing with copywriters too we're just yeah there's i mean there's a huge range of copywriters and sure some copywriters are what's called a direct response copywriter and within that segment of copywriters there are some have been nothing against this i love copywriters but there is known to be a small small segment of I'm saying this very carefully because I don't think it's true for many of them. But sure, there are some copywriters that are slightly skeezy. But then there's the rest of us, the other 99.99% who are just like trying to help businesses employ people by, you know, selling their products that are good to people who want them. That's what I do. And those are the copywriters I know. And as for being young and hip, or that's awesome. I had no idea I was. <laughs> I was either of those things. So happy to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think you and I are almost exactly the same age. Oh. So I, I'm, I think I'm maybe just trying to flatter myself nice. here and uh, nice. make myself feel okay, younger you than I really am. You don't have to back out of that. Let's keep it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Keep awesome. Young. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Moving forward. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that said, you know, Maybe this stereotype of, of you know, the, the not cool copywriter is just that, a stereotype. That said, what you tend to do and what te you tend to teach is different from a traditional direct response sure. copywriting. I mean, you, you, you've you coined the term conversion copywriter. Can you tell us a little bit about how that's different from what people might be more used to with direct response copywriting? Yeah, totally. Definitely. So conversion copywriting is based in direct response copywriting, but it's taking all of the better practices from that world and applying them online to an audience that is increasingly skeptical. Not that people haven't always been skeptical. The saying has always been a fool and his money are soon parted. And I think people believe that copywriting and marketing is out to part fools from their money. So there's always been this skepticism, but but it's a little bit different online. Um, it's, it's a very different space versus like sending a mailer to somebody's house and having not their undivided attention when they open that mailer, but far more attention than you have online where there are, you might have uh, your prospect might have 50 other tabs open or 100 other emails in their inbox. And um, you really need to work harder to not only get noticed, but to hold their attention to make them trust you and like you and then to buy from you and keep buying from you and be happy with that. So conversion copywriting takes like the best of long form sales copywriting of how to persuade people, how to get them to like you and puts that online and helps businesses use that to grow their businesses. 
So conversion copywriting, as you just described, is what you're doing during the day. Yes. You're writing your novels into the night. Yes. Sometimes. Let's go back. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back to when you were young. Uh, Did you oh. always know you were going to be a writer? Is something you were always is writing something you were always drawn to? Yeah, I always I always wanted to be, but I saw and maybe this is a bad thing, but I saw a movie when I was little. It was on in the background or something at like my nana's house, I think, and it was about this this couple. This writing, this couple, they were writers, and they were both struggling novelists, and they just couldn't couldn't make it happen. Their books would get published, and they'd sell nothing. Um, and it was so bad that they divorced. And then finally, one of them went on to commercial success. And my takeaway from that, and I grew up very on the very low, low, low end of middle class. That's to put it nicely. So I didn't want to grow up and have to worry about being in a tough position. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, no, (laughs) writers don't make any money. And that's not why anybody writes. Nobody writes to make money. But we all know it's hard to make money writing novels. So with that in mind, yeah, I always wanted to be a writer, but I always knew and maybe that was silly and maybe others would disagree, but I don't I don't think so. I, I always knew that I would have to do something else and then write for fun and if anything ever came of that great but I didn't want and still don't want the pressure to earn to be on on the books that I write because I think that would change what I'd what I'd write I think that's wonderful that you had that lesson as a young at a young age because I think a lot of us discover it at you know 30 years old. Oh, hey, I'm not going to get no rich fucking. off my novels, right? <laughs> and you might, but but it might happen a lot later. It might happen tomorrow, but it might happen a lot later too. And so for me, I'd rather I'd rather not have to worry about everything. But there's a lot to be said for being a hungry writer because, you know, hunger can drive a lot of passion and make you like get up early and stay up late. But hunger also means you have to work three jobs, which leaves you with less time. So back and forth on that one, right? But but it could happen. It could still happen. So you, I mean, you knew that you were going to have to figure out a way to use your writing skills and your interest in writing to also generate income as and a career a- along with the work that you wanted to do as a creative writer. And I think that actually informed your academic career. I remember hearing you mention in a talk some of the work that you did as part of your thesis was really in the realm of what you're now doing today as an online copywriter. Yeah, I mean, my undergrad was all about creative writing. It was, an, I was an English major. It was honors English. It was, it was good. It was a good, a good path to take if you're going to be an English major. I think at least because it sets you up well to go on and do further education afterward. Um, so after that, I was torn between going to law school, which everybody said was like the next logical step, which sounded terrible. As much as I liked the LSATs, <laughs> I did not want to be a lawyer. I wanted to do like the games that are in the LSATs, which are actually really fun. <laughs> I could just keep taking the LSATs again and again. They're they're really fun. Um, but but I, so I decided not to do law school. I took a day of law school, then I dropped out for personal reasons. But from that point on, um, yeah, I went and did my master's in communications and technology, where I was, I, my thesis was on how to persuade people in online environments, which it's a master's. You can't get that deeply into it. And that's a really broad topic. I went more narrow than that, but that's generally what it came down to. And that, of course, was It was really helpful for me to move into this space where I felt confident speaking about persuading people online and then, of course, doing it, testing it, seeing how it works, and then just sharing that more with the people who don't have the luxury of taking a master's degree in this and and then trying to apply it themselves. So condensing what I learned there and sharing it in ways that are maybe more consumable than a two-year graduate program would be for most people. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Right. So as, as you travel along that career, either moving through your academic career or then the early years of your career as a copywriter, were there mentors or teachers or coaches along the way who have influenced you and, and helped you, you know, move along as a writer? Yeah, there are some actually. So, so the novel that I put out was a young adult novel. I did two young adult novels and I'm shifting away from that. It's not 
entirely true to who I am as a writer. It just felt like the fun thing to do. And so when I think about my mentors, my mentors were in short story writing. And so we'll see where I go if I go down that path. So I did a lot of the writing that I did in undergrad was very um, post-structuralist. So kind of stuff that doesn't have much of an audience unless you too are post-structuralist. <laughs> um, so, but that's fine. And that's where there's that terror, you know, between commercial success or just like continuing to write for yourself and keep the book to yourself because no publisher is going to publish a post-structuralist novel. <laughs> it's just I, I don't know. I, I, I think the mass is going to come around to Derrida any day oh, now. Oh, really? It's, That's it, oh, yeah. that it, it'll It's the next Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, you know, sure. All of a sudden, sure. everyone's going to be reading Derrida yeah. on the bus. Yeah, Derrida. They'll just like naturally, oh yeah, you've got that. Perfect. Yeah. Um, that'll be the day. That'd be lovely though. So, but that was, that's funny that you say that it was, it was brilliantly fun to write. Um, I do have a novel on my, on my laptop. That's a work in progress that goes down that path maybe one day, but all of this to say that my, that my mentors were my writing instructors when I was in undergrad, Dr. Hollingshead, he's a Canadian writer and, uh, Dr. Allman, Bert Allman, he's also a Canadian writer. And so I totally admired and looked up to them. They're wonderful people, incredible writers. And so they're the, yeah, they're absolutely the ones that have been my inspiration as I've been writing. And they're, when I think about what I want to write, I think about them a lot. And outside of that, for copywriting, I have absolutely, I have, I have different mentors for sure, like Brian Clark. But yeah, so that's, that's, those are the people that have, Help me most understand what kind of writer I am and should be. Although it's always a work in progress, but they, they're the ones that are in my head now as I move forward with my writing. So you're obviously a very well-known copywriter at this point, but from I can tell you from my perspective, I think of you as one of my writing mentors because oh. I've read several of your copywriting That's books. Awesome. I've taken several of your courses. Uh, so I'm curious... Uh, when did that become part of your career? You know, you could obviously just be working with startups, doing the copywriting, but somewhere along the way here, you started teaching other people like myself. How did that come about? Well, it was a request, actually. So I can only help so many startups and startups just don't have a lot of money to spend on things that are important, um, sadly, because everything's important when you're starting a business. It feels like you have to do everything, especially online, where so the next person, the next blog post you read is like, oh, here's how I use Snapchat to grow my business by X percent. And then people are like, holy crap, I have to do Snapchat now too? So they've got all of these concerns. And the idea of hiring even a freelance copywriter to come in and work on their copy sometimes they don't even know what which part to work on right like there's everything that they're producing is copy from ads to their landing pages to their emails to their in-app messages it's all copy and so you look at it and think like well I could hire some freelancer to do that which sounds expensive um, and would be expensive or I can learn to do this myself since everything I do throughout the day involves copywriting there's, of course, obviously strategy and other things, but when it comes down to executing on the strategy, copy is a hugely important part of that. So when I kept saying no to people, like, no, sorry, I can't help you out or, or whatever it might have been, sorry, I'm too expensive or whatever, <laughs> um, they would say, like, okay, great, but how do I learn from you? And so that's where um, we wrote the e-books. Uh, I wrote the e-books, and, and that moved into video training because we found that even though the ebooks are consumable, like they're, they're 50 pages approximately, the updated ones are a little bit more, um, like 60 pages just because of extra examples we've added, um, but they're still short. They're very short training manuals, and even still, people struggle to read them because when it comes time to write that cold email, you're like, well, I just, just where do I, how? Does someone tell me exactly how to write this cold email, please? And you don't want to read the whole book, so you want to look at a, a video or two. Um, and so that's why we decided to go into to video courses and video courses that are based around really short lessons. 
And I think one of the things that's really interesting about, you know, what differentiates your teaching from some other copywriting courses that I've taken is, you know, I, I work with uh, fiction authors, okay. and I think sometimes fiction authors get overly focused on their writing itself, uh. and they forget the story, mm -hmm. right, that the heart of the piece. And I've taken several copywriting courses where they're like, you know, here's your sales letter template. Mm -hmm. But with you, you're all about the research. So can you talk a bit <laughs> yeah. about that? I think that's really something you stress over and over again is doing the research and knowing your audience. Yeah. Tell me a bit about that. Yeah, and I, I love that you have taken that away because sometimes I'm still baffled. Like when people are like, oh, here, <laughs> but do you have a template for me? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> no, I have no template. No, because templates are what copywriters create to sell courses. Like they... Everybody on the planet would rather just have a template to fill in. Just give me the template. Like even when you're plotting a novel, it would be it would be a huge time saver for somebody to say, "Here, this is exactly how you plot a thriller. This is exactly what to put in there. Now just go sub it in." But you would you'd, you'd lose a lot, and it's actually not true. There's not always going to be a right way to do it. There's just not. There's just not. So there's one part science, one part art to basically everything that we do. Um, and so for for copywriting, sure, it'd be nice and easy to have a template where it's just like fill in the blanks and this is your new cold email. Um, but that's acting like every person on the receiving end is the same. That's acting like your product and your business and your price are the same. So it can't all, there is no way to template a human, right? Like some person on the other side who wants to be engaged in a way that feels real and authentic to them. They want to see themselves on the page. They want to hear a voice that they like and want to be associated with on the page. That doesn't come in a template. That can't come in a template. It can, however, be absolutely found in research. In If you're trying to sell to somebody else, any salesperson in real life, if they want to sell you something, they talk directly to you, they listen to the words you're saying, and they feed them back to you in the affirmative. Like, you know you're worried about this because you just actually listen to the person say, I'm worried about that, and then they feed it back to you and say why you don't have to worry about that. You can't get the, to those with a template. We could say, okay, every person who's buying a used car wants to make sure that it won't break down on the highway and that um, it has fewer than 100,000 kilometers on it. Okay, fine. That's a template for you. But now, now sell it to the person who just walked into the store. You can't just walk up to them and say those things. You can't say it's a hundred thousand, it's fewer than a hundred thousand kilometers on it, and yeah, it'll drive on the highway. They're like, holy crap, I, I don't even want to drive on the highway, and I hadn't even thought about it possibly breaking down. What are you talking about? I just want to get a car for my kid who's like just got his right. All of those things that like make a person human and that make them really want to acquire a product. So that's where only by listening can you possibly. And this is what I have absolutely seen in my oh, more than a decade of writing copy and testing it. The only way to make sure that you're getting closer to the results you want is to listen closer to your customer and then repeat back to them what they said to you. It is not more complicated than that. So you just finished a full week of focusing on Facebook yes. copywriting on copy hackers. Yes. What was your big takeaway from that approach to copywriting in that you know it was pretty funny the the opening post you did I think three posts this week yeah. right and the first the opening line of the first post is like so words don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the bad news, it's right? True. Copywriters. It's true. But uh, it, but I mean, I think a lot of, especially, you know, fiction authors who, who listen to this podcast are, are fascinated about this idea of figuring out a way to use Facebook to grow their audience, to sell books. Um, what was your big takeaway after, you know, focusing on Facebook advertising for a week? Yeah, I mean, it continues to be a, a bit of a mystery to me, and that's largely because I need more experience with it. But what I, could, what I took away was that it's not as hard as it seems once you like know about the Facebook pixel and once you know how important an image actually is in your ad um, 
then from that point on, it's just, it's like the remaining 10%, right? So you just, you keep refining and working at that 10%. And that 10% has a lot in it, right? There's a lot going on in there, like determining who your audience is and setting those up as custom audiences and all of that kind of stuff. And then making sure you're writing messages that actually matter to them or that are likely to um, get their attention, just like any ad any ad ever um you've needed to get people's attention with it so so yeah that that was that was my takeaway that it's not as scary as i thought but it will like everything it will take me practicing and i think every person who hasn't done it a lot before it will take us all practicing um before we get to a place where we feel we know what the hell we're doing with these (laughs) things and oh i know how to make it work right yeah so speaking of scary things, let's uh, transition over to your fiction writing. Cause, yes. I mean, I'm sure everyone wants to talk to you about copywriting, but I, I'd love to touch base a bit on your YA novels. Yeah, sure. So they, they and Merchant series, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is what I think every writer deals with at some point. So the Anne Merchant novels, it was a, a trilogy about this this girl who finds herself at a school um, she didn't expect to be at, and she has to figure out what's going on. And so she does, thankfully, but it's not what she wanted to hear, <laughs> tragically. Um, so, yeah, so it was a, it's a trilogy, and I actually stopped it after the second book. I decided not to continue writing them, largely because, I mean, there are two, two key reasons. One, my business takes up an incredible amount of time, and it's growing fast, and it's it's just doing really cool things, and I'm, I'm still creatively satisfied with it as well. And so mm-hmm. making time to write the Anne Merchant novels, I was, I was struggling hard with it. Like, as it is, I'm already at my desk at 7.30, and then back at it like throughout the day i only leave for lunch and dinner and go to the (laughs) bathroom and then back here at like until 10 30 at night so i'm here a lot in front of my computer and that is for work and there's just not that much time and i know that i could make time for it if i was really enjoying it but um yeah truth be told i I don't think that I'm cut out for the world of young adult fiction. I'm just I I there's some young adult fiction that I think is doing incredible stuff and I think that that's awesome, but yeah, it's not for me my so librarians found that my books skewed adults and I have a hard time figuring out how to make them not feel like books for adults because I think that the topics that I tend to want to cover and find interesting to cover are, you know, not things that a librarian wants a 13-year-old girl or boy to read, frankly. <laughs> so, and it's shocking how much when you're writing, I guess, anything. I've only had experience with young adult novels, but when you're writing those, librarians librarians have some serious pull on what gets out there and what doesn't. Um, and God love them, too, for it. But it just means for me, if if librarians factor in and if I do write in a more in I write about topics that feel older and I use language that feels older then it doesn't make sense for me to keep writing YA it it actually feels really hard to write it in a way that's unsatisfying um so so yeah so I've moved away from that my literary agent and I are you know still we're working actually right now on an outline for something quite different that's for an adult audience so I'll probably move in that direction but um but yeah I decided to stop the trilogy after book two is there much of a crossover between your experience as a copywriter and your experience as a fiction writer? Because I was reading Anne Merchant and, and I was, you know, in the opening chapter, she's walking to school mm-hmm. and she looks behind her and she sees someone following her and then she looks back and the girl's gone. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I was like, oh, is, is Joanna opening loops right now? <laughs> right? <laughs> it's true. And writing for a certain audience obviously is a big part of it, but I didn't think of it as an open loop. <laughs> <laughs> at the time, but that's true. I mean, there's so much overlap between. I actually have a post that I've been chipping away at about what copywriters can learn from novelists and vice versa. 
maybe one day I'll actually finish the thing and publish it. But there's, I know, I wish I had it handy. There's, there's quite a bit of overlap. There's also ways that they're completely and totally different. But there is absolutely overlap between, you can learn a lot from both, uh, being a copywriter and then writing a novel and writing a novel and then writing copy. Well, that was my next question, actually, was this idea that, you know, I know so many people who can write a fantastic 80,000 word novel, but when they sit down to write a three paragraph blurb, they just fall to pieces. I'm, so I was, do you have any tips for those fiction authors out there who are faced with doing some copywriting to sell their fiction books? Uh, any tips for those copywriters? For those writers who are trying to write, well, novel yeah, books. for you know, yeah. for say an indie, an indie fiction author who needs to write their own Amazon blurb, you know, what are the kind of basic oh, copywriting oh, well, things those they are need tough. to keep in mind? The okay, blurb was <laughs> oh my gosh, the blurb for the book was right. a nightmare. Titling the book was a nightmare. Like <laughs> the typical, the shorter the copy, the harder it is to write. The blurb, the blurb is, yeah, I guess it's a lot like if you were to write an email or the opening of a, a sales page, you need to hook them and like hook them hard, um, which is, which is tough. Um, I, it's, it's tough. I mean, just, just get right down to the core of it. Like, oh, what, but it, it, it's hard, um, but it does, it, it just takes, Finding, figuring out what's so really – so there's this thing in copywriting called the battlefield principle. And that's like, okay, so don't, wa don't start your book or your copy or your blurb or like back cover copy um, by walking people up to the battlefield. Start by dropping them into the middle of the big battle. And now what is that battle? That's like what we have to def understand before we can say, okay, well, that's how I'm dropping them into it. So it's like figuring out like the, the core of the book, of the story itself, and starting them there while also weaving in. It's just too hard. I don't have copywriting tips. It's so hard. You have to in so much or you have to choose to leave it out you can look at every book cover blurb out there and they're all saying different things i think twilight um not that that's what everybody wants to write absolutely but um necessarily but twilight i think the back cover for that book was snippet from the book itself where mm. bella was talking about being in love with a vampire and it was really cool but it was just purely from the book Hunger Games, I think, was something similar to that. Anyway, I would just advise you to go look at the back of other books. I know that's not helpful, but it's just like keeping a swipe file in copywriting. Just see what other people are doing, and then when it comes time for you to do it, just look at those 30 books that are for the audience you're trying to attract and, and do your best to make it better than all of them. It's so hard. <laughs> it's so that's no. I think that's a great tip, and, and that uh, kind of goes back to what we were talking about—the core of copywriting. You do your research, right? Go out there and see what's what's being done, and and uh, make sure you're hooking your audience. But you know, speaking of this idea of you know blurb writing being hard and novel writing being hard and copywriting being hard, you're actually working on some software that might make life a little bit easier for authors. Do you want to tell me about Air Story? Yes, I do. I love Air Story. So as as I was writing the novels and as I continue to write novels um, and also writing, so I produce a lot of content, um, whether it's blog posts that go on other people's sites or blog posts on my own, lots of things, all the things. Think of everything that's written, and I'm doing a lot of it. And it all – now, every writer has a different process. So Air Story is a solution to help writers organize their ideas into something they can work with. Um, so by that, I mean – um, you capture your ideas as cards, save them into Air Story, and then when it comes time, when you're ready to start outlining your novel or outlining your blog post or an ebook or whatever it is you might be working on, you 
start dragging and dropping those cards into the outline, moving things around, adding headlines, pulling things out, so on and so on. And then when you feel, or at any point when you feel you're ready to look at it in a document form, you can just tick a little box and the outline transitions into a document. So you could start writing right in it. So what AirStory is trying to do and what we're beta testing it right now and it's going very well. So we feel really good about it. And it won't work for everybody because some people have very strict writing styles where they're like, nope, I always use my notebook and I carry it with me everywhere. And that's the only way I do it. And I tear out pages and organize them on the floor in this room I keep just for that purpose. So if you have that as your writing process, (laughs) Air Story isn't right for you. But if you're comfortable taking notes on your phone, taking notes on your computer, writing in like Word or Google Docs or, you know, even Scrivener, um, if you're using any of those, you will absolutely love Air Story because you can capture your notes and then just drag and drop them into place. And so the time savings, because obviously the blank white page is a scary, scary thing in a lot of cases. Sometimes it's wonderful. You just like open up a document and start like typing in there and you feel wonderful. And then that session is done. And now it's the next time you have to do it. And it's not as easy or as wonderful to do it. So um, that's where I think every writer knows a saying that the cure for writer's block is research. Um, And so that's what Air Story is there to do is to help you go out gather your ideas, gather your research, always be working and sending your ideas to Air Story because we all are always working. When you're working on a novel, it is always in your head. I don't know if you've had this experience, but for me, when I'm at the movies and I'm waiting for the movie to start, I get filled with ideas and it's like the worst because (laughs) it's dark and I can't do anything. So I sit at the very back row in the back corner with my phone because I know I will have ideas and I type them where nobody can see the screen light and that, so whenever you're out, you're, you're getting these ideas. And so you just send those back to air story. Then when you're ready to outline, they're sitting there waiting for you and you just go ahead and do it, which is really good for character sketches, for keeping track of things like, birth dates um, for your characters, which is a big deal, the timeline of things, your outline for the novel itself, and of course, then going ahead and writing. And, and you can invite, if you have a literary agent or an editor, you can invite them and they can go through and comment and share and add other notes for your consideration and so on and so forth. So that's what Air Story is there to do. It's, it, it was, first of all, scratching a big itch for me as a novelist, and we've also worked hard to make it great for content writers as well. Fantastic. So if people want to learn more about Air Story, where do we send them? Airstory.co. So it's one word, A-I-R-S-T-O-R-Y dot C-O. And if folks want to learn more about what you're doing, uh, they can hop over to Copy Hackers. Is that right? Yes. I'm always on at Copy Hackers. There's always... Always something going on at Copy Hackers, lots to learn, hopefully. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Copyhackers.com, and I'm on Twitter at Copy Hackers with an S. Fantastic. Was there anything else you wanted to leave the folks with today? No, no, just that, you know, I think writers are the most courageous people on the planet, and I completely dig that you got this whole podcast talking to them. And um, yeah, just, just keep doing what you do, everybody. <laughs> awesome. Well, I mean, this podcast is all about talking to the people who help writers yeah. to succeed. And, you know, on the copywriting side of things, you've certainly helped me a ton. So it was a real honor for me to get uh-huh. you on the show and get the opportunity to chat with you because you've certainly been someone who's helped me out along the way with all the work that you do with your courses and your website and everything. So thank you so much for taking the time to join me here today and to speak with my audience. Oh, I'm so glad. Thanks for saying that. Absolutely. It's been a blast. So there you have it. My interview with Joanna Weeb of Copy Hackers. 
as I mentioned, Joanna has been someone who's been a bit of a mentor for me in my own business journey. Now, if you are a aspiring author and you're feeling lost or confused or blocked and you're looking for some help along the way, someone who can help you to make your novel writing journey a little bit easier the way Joanna helped me through copywriting education, I would love to work with you. I work as a one-on-one writing coach as well as running a group coaching program. You can learn all about my author services over at www.kevintjohns.com. If you click on the coaching tab, you can choose one-on-one or you can choose group coaching and you can learn all about how you and I can work together to help you achieve your writing goals. Well, that's it, guys. You know, I was thrilled about this episode. I was really excited to get to talk with someone as brilliant as Joanna. I love her copywriting. I also love her fiction writing. So it was really cool to get to touch base with her. Next episode, I am speaking with Ani Alexander, the host of Write to Be Read, an extremely popular writing podcast, much like this one. So make sure you tune in next week. I'll see you there over at the next episode of The Writing Coach.